So I would uh, like to start, maybe you can switch on your cameras if you can, uh, then we can see you. That would be nice. Um, um, and Adam, maybe you want to go closer to the microphone. I think sometimes uh, we couldn't hear you so well. Um, okay, let's start. Um, I think I, we have Pietro, Arda and uh, Stefan with us. And uh, I would like to first give the word to Stefan. Stefan, you've seen now all this, uh, this presentations here. Um, how much actually does this uh, match uh, with what you as Anna Park are experiencing these days in the market? Yeah, so th thanks a lot for the invitation. And for, for me, it was always interesting to see, I would say, a bit the European view, but on the other hand, the, the Chinese view. And uh, Michael, I think you can confirm yeah, we are still far away from what happens in China. But uh, you asked me also a few weeks ago if we can meet uh, a terawatt in Europe, and I mentioned very clearly. Um, on the other hand, uh, you asked me also where are the big, biggest bottleneck, and I think we have this discussion every month or something. And I always mention three things: number one, per permits; number two, modules; number three, installers. So these are for me the key topics which I have. Let's start with the permits. I think. Let us see. I mean, it's a very sad situation with Ukraine and so on, but we all know, and you just mentioned it in your introduction, uh, human being can be very reactive and very fast if they want to change something. So, and I think we reach now a situation which I think is good for renewables because we are getting now calls from local communities who refuse to take solar in the official hearing. So they call us back now and say, hey guys, sorry, we had a voting, a few people were against it. I wanted to be re-elected as a mayor, but I can only be re-elected as a mayor if we do solar now. So, and this has changed a lot. And this is really what you see at the moment where I would say the public hearings are changing the, I would say the mood. And this is in Germany, Netherlands, specifically where you have these, I call it beauty contest, um, but I would say all around. Yeah? So this is, I would say for me, uh, I would say the bottleneck, which is not a bottleneck anymore. Yeah. I think we have to work a lot on uh, de-bottlenecking all official uh, bureaucracies and other activities, but I'm pretty sure, and you've seen it already in the announcement and we call of the Eastern package from the German government, um, there are a lot of changes now. So, and I think it will happen now. And we've seen from Pedro now that there are discussions about to bring solar also on, on areas which are normally reserved for, 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 for natural con con conservation. But on the other hand, we all know that you can combine PV with uh, with with nature, and then you have excellent biodiversity activities. So I think it's also a good way uh, to re-naturalize also industrial land. Um, modules, yeah, we have heard it now. I think it is, uh, I would say, a challenge. Um, but but on the other hand, the good thing is what we have seen here in Germany, and this was my question to, to Pietro, why we have only, I would say, nearly zero uh, uh, unsubsidized PPA projects in, in Germany. Oh, I, I probably I changed the color. I couldn't see it. Um, but we've seen now that at least for, for Germany now, we will see 100%, 50% unsubsidized PV projects. The interesting thing is then that these unsubsidized uh, projects are generally corporate PPAs, yeah? and they have no hard deadline. And this is an advantage to balance a bit the supply chain. Yeah? Um, and I think this is also important to understand for, for all the, I would say, Asian manufacturers, because I think they still have this, uh, the, the, the deadline, I increase the prices and so on. We have a lot of projects, not even in the pipeline. They are ready to build, but we wait if we get, I would say, a good, and I call it a fair offer for, 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 for modules. And probably a few of you have seen that we signed with IKEA now in total 500 megawatt all around Europe. Um, and IKEA has, has a very clear guideline. They want to become CO2 footprint free, even for the suppliers. Yeah? So not only for their retail chains, but also for the suppliers of their structures and, and, and material. And if this is the case, then we can wait for a year or even longer. Yeah? So this means auto auto medically good for, for us, but also good for the manufacturers. We can balance a bit the um, um, demand supply situation. I think the big, biggest bottleneck which I see, and this is what I haven't seen here now, is really the installers. Um, all the activities on residential, commercial, industrial, and even large scale has an issue, and the issue is installers. Simple electricians, mechanical people, um, and uh, also because of the war, 
uh, I, I don't want to know how many truck drivers left their truck on the parking place from Ukraine and w went back to, to Ukraine. And these are, I think, hundreds of thousands. Yeah? Um, and this is what, what we have seen already now. And uh, we've seen it in the UK, which was mainly driven by the Brexit. Um, but now, because of the war, a lot of people left mainland Europe yeah, or Western Europe. So that means we have now really challenges to find installers. Yeah? And especially when you want to make a boost of a commercial and residential where you normally need even more uh, installer, um, um, then I think you will autom automatically see also a bit of, bit of trend um, that everything will take a bit longer. This is, I would say, a challenge. But again, permit, I think fine. Even land, I have no real issue at the moment. There's always a scarcity, which is clear because competition is increasing. Modules, I think, is somehow balanced, but let's see. Yeah. Um, but for me, the biggest issue is really installer. Okay, okay. But um, if you are um, talking about permitting, I think um, uh, when you discuss in, in, in policy circles, um, permitting is always the topic. Uh, so everyone points at that and it doesn't matter if it is a rooftop or if it is um, if it is ground mount. I think there, there are these issues and, and now of course come these uh, fancy technologies like floating agri PV and where people simply say, hey, um, if you're space constrained or if you have other issues, we have something else. But obviously that's expensive. Agri PV is something for the future and floating PV is now happening as I understand. But of course, it's more expensive than a uh, ground mount. So are you looking into that? Or so what are your, um, also your, your answers to that? If some politician says, hey, but there are all these fancy new, uh, new possibilities. And I, I think the traditional uh, uh, utility scale uh, on, the, on the ground uh, field is always, I would say the easiest, the best and the fastest. Let's end the cheapest, let's keep it simple. Agri-PV is a bit of, I call it a buzzword. If you really see how many projects were, are really installed, then it's, I would say, a handful, yeah? And uh, we all know uh, the LCOE cost is double. So <laughs> that's a matter of fact, yeah? Uh, is it, by the way, interesting to combine agriculture with PV? Yeah, fine. And you can, you can, you can move together and we need the landowners and we need the farmers, yeah? This is very clear. And if this is a bridge building activity, then I'm completely happy with this. But 99%, are still very, very traditional uh, ground mounted system. I think we see probably a bit more tracking systems now also in the Northern part of Europe. Yeah? And this is mainly driven by uh, demand supply of energy because when you sign PPAs with, with corporates, they don't want to discuss with you anymore what kind of modules or tracker or not or cable or something. They, they ask about, okay, how much energy you produce, what kind of electron do you deliver? And by, by the way, ideally we can deliver a load. Yeah? Um, and this is, I think, more and more important. Uh, but this gives us also a bit the freedom to select a bit more our pro pro products. Yeah? And in the past, it was mainly driven by technical advisors. Uh, and at the moment, it's, uh, it's driven by us, to be honest, by the owner of the plans, because we signed a PPA about megawatt hours and not about what kind of cable you use. Yeah? And this makes our life a bit easier. So we are much more flexible. Okay. Um, Ara, maybe maybe coming to to the supply situation. Um, I think uh, Stefan said, okay, modules is one of his three three points. Um, obviously, um, there there have been issues, um, as we learned also from Jessica. She doesn't say it's at least over overall it's not so much of an issue actually the lockdown in China. But nevertheless, of course, the high prices are and um, logistics still is um, so. Um, Okay, can you give us a shine a little bit um, more, more light on, on how how it is in terms of supply? So, will um, will, will companies if they order modules now really also get what they order, or will there be discussions? Because you know we had in the past also the dis discussions. At some point prices went up. People have not expecting that. Then there were renegotiations. It's uh, solar has been of course also always. A little bit of a wild west uh, in this regard, depending uh, sometimes if we had an oversupply situation on the one or the on the demand side. So, 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 can you can you just uh, give us a little bit more background on this? I mean, um, of course, the root of this problem is is I guess um, when in July 2020 in both uh, Polysilicon and uh, 
uh, module prices unnecessarily hit the bottom line ever because of this uh, COVID impact. And whereas at the beginning it was not possible to physically produce uh, in China and later the demand cut in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Europe. And then and since, I guess, um, two years time, um, uh, increasing demand worldwide. Uh, and also we have seen many events, you remember last year, we had an, a big polysilicon shortage, the prices uh, increased uh, over 200%. And then um, Suez Canal accident happened and, and the logistics viral cutting. And now I guess it was only two to 3,000 uh, US per containers. Now it is a fixed uh, a new standard of over 10,000, which has a significant impact on the, on the, on the model cost as well. And, and, and later, maybe you remember last, last Q4, we have an electricity curtailment topic in, 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 in China uh, as well. And then Again, we have seen an uh, increase in cost and, uh, because of the raw material supply constraint as well. Um, so on. And, and, and finally, now we have uh, this um, Russian uh, oil situation and, and high uh, energy and oil prices, which also has an impact on now um, uh, raw materials. For example, glass, uh, it, it needs to. And um, LNG and oil, and, and those are now um, extremely uh, high prices. It also leads uh, for raw material price increases, not only polysilicon, like we have to show, I guess, uh, maybe end of the year, um, we will see sufficient polysilicon supply. I cannot say now, but maybe end of the year, we can have a sufficient polysilicon supply in the industry to cover the global demand. Um, but still, we have seen uh, a pressure from the uh, raw material because of these high, high prices. So I guess since January to today, we have around, um, maybe I can also give some numbers, around 0 0.8 cents uh, increase of the uh, raw materials for on, on the module price, let's say, coming from EVA, uh, aluminum, and also the last where they need and high energy. And also a lockdown situation, um, now in China, it seems okay. Yeah, manufacturing uh, manufacturers' uh, operation rate is high, is, is correct. But still, uh, some ports' uh, operational rates are uh, low. I mean, I, I maybe 10 to 15 percent uh, less uh, container volume could, could be uh, shipped in, in some ports. So I, I still expect uh, some delays uh, for this uh, next quarter, maybe in in in, in Europe as well. Uh, but later, um, uh, it could be uh, in a better situation. Just give you an example. For example, now uh, one of the biggest glass manufacturers in China, who has uh, around 30 gigawatt of production, it's, it's completely locked down. So they cannot do physically production. Um, so uh, we hope that this situation uh, will be end soon. And then uh, we will have, again, a steady supply. Uh, I guess this is uh, all related with, with each other. Uh, but uh, on the other end, I, I, I fully agree with Stefan uh, for all these uh, problems and uh, for the Europe manpower permits and and, 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 and and what 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 about pricing? I think um, Jessica showed um, that basically I think uh, prices are around one one ninety RMB or around twenty seven cents uh, euro cents uh, at the moment. So and uh, will will stay that level. So so. Um, think on the supply end um, um, and also demand side, what are you seeing there? Does it work for projects? And um, maybe Stefan, what does it mean for you? Because of course, on the one hand, um, of course, as, uh, as, as Pietra has shown, um, um, wholesale prices went up, but now that um, renewables kick in, they also are, have been coming down quite a bit. Um, so so what, what does it mean for projects in general? We've also been seeing actually that some of the deadlines in, in Portugal for the, for the auctions were, were postponed um, because um, simply the bids were too low um, compared to, to what, what prices are now. So, so what, I, what are you seeing there? I think at the moment, um, there is also, I would say, a change at the off takers. Yeah? So uh, in the past, we had our traditional investment funds and they bought projects and we had our technical advisors da, 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 and they were focusing on PR and so on. Yeah? Then we had, I would say, the first round of PPAs around Europe. And this was more, uh, I would say, the, 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 the energy distributors or, for example, large utilities. Yeah? They had also, you felt already a bit a different view 
uh, because they are thinking much more long term. It's not like the typical 20 years. They think about 30 years or something, yeah, or even even longer. So I think the whole financial modeling, I would say, comes over from US to Europe now that you have the need to, to model the, the, the prices uh, uh, and the whole financial activities for more than 30 years. And now it's even changing that the big corporates, the RE100 guys who, who signed in, the, uh, in uh, this, this contract that they want to become CO2 full footprint zero. And this means automatically, as I mentioned before, it is more, it is, this is a, another different discussion. You talk with them more about um, uh, how and when you can deliver the energy, yeah? um, including the information about uh, um, what is uh, um, that they want to have access to the GO, so the CO2 certificates, which have a high value for them. Yeah? Um, and and the, these large corporate players, they know very well, they have no other option yeah? Th than to, to change this. It's not only a business model, it is really they can be out of the market if they don't deliver a CO2 footprint, uh, I don't know, table, let's say like this, or a TV. Yeah? So the market pressure is much, much stronger. But, and now the but comes, uncertainty is always bad. Yeah? And, and we haven't spoken, we've spoken now a lot about logistics, supply chain, products, and so on. But please don't underestimate that market uncertainty means that the cost of capital will increase. Yeah? And this is important for us because when we are the owner and we are making a PPA with a Deutsche Bahn or IKEA or whatever, then we have to cal cal calculate the whole LCUE. Is it for 20 or 30 years is another discussion. But the cost of capital will have a, also a huge impact on this. Yeah? And, and what do you think, so let's, let's assume module prices would go down to, to the low 20s where they've been, or they've been even below that uh, um, a while ago. Would, would that increase the market dramatically? Um? Um, I think it will not, be, I would say not dramatically, but for sure it will increase. Yeah? I mean, we have a high demand. When we are getting, for example, a, um, a t tender for, for energy supply, then we don't react anymore because we are getting every day 10 yeah, from, from, from large off-takers. Um, and, and I think this is, this, is, uh, this is, I would say, also one of the, the, the main topics. But um, I think we need to ensure and we, need to be, we should not for, forget if we make financial modeling for 20 or 30 years, the question is what happens now with the energy prices? It's very high, but it's quite obvious that this will change when we have, I don't know, a terawatt in Europe. Yeah? And then automatically it means that we have ne negative prices from, I would say, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Yeah, and this means that we have to de develop also different strategies. And this is with, with the storage, this is with hydrogen, this is probably making trackers, east-west systems and so on, or whatever, the, what, what Portugal is doing to combine wind and solar in one of the grid connection points that you balance it. Yeah? So you have to be, be creative. So on one hand, we see um, a good, good demand uh, on, on green energy, um, but on the other hand, do not underestimate that uh, there will be a lot of changes in the ne next few years in terms of the energy price. Will it stay high? Yeah, but not uh, during lunchtime. Yeah? So this is very clear. The price will go down. This is all an impact on the financial modeling. This is what a lot of people underestimate. Mm -hmm. um, Ada, Pietro, maybe um, you, you, you both also showed that there is um, a change from, from ground mount towards more towards um, um, rooftop um, demand. Um, let, let's discuss a little bit um, how, why this is happening and how this is happening. So why maybe also, um, is it also because you, because I think the module price doesn't matter so much in, um, in rooftop systems. Is it because um, um, uh, permitting is easier? Um, is it, um, is it because people are maybe also now just become aware and are afraid of uh, of uh, of their their bill and simply say, okay, I want to have my solar system, I want to have actually a battery, and I want to have a heat pump, basically, so that I, that I get more or less through the next winter. Um, so, 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 what are the drivers um, for for this? Maybe Pietro first. Uh, so, and... yeah, just perhaps just one before I answer your question, just a wanted to say I couldn't agree with, more with what Stefan said on cannibalization. When we say cannibalization is just uh, PV revenues being eaten by the success of PV as you add more non-flexible PV on the grid, that, that has an impact on, on revenues. So 
um, uh, we expect electricity prices to drop. Uh, investors are aware of this, even though at the moment power prices are at record highs. And um, yeah, but 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 the market could actually uh, change very rapidly. Mm. Depending on the on on the country, we know, for example, still going back to Iberia, which is uh, is an up and coming market. It's an an energy island, right? It's it's a it's a it has its own grid, and if if you if you load a lot of PV capacity there in the coming years, that that will surely surely um, have an impact on an, uh, electricity prices and you probably heard about uh, the press release um, which just came out like uh, on Sunday for the first time authorities had to cur curtail the electricity there and, and prices dropped from the 200 euros per megawatt hours to three euros per megawatt hours it, it's this is just a, perhaps a small uh, signal but it, it's something that um, investors uh, will have to increasingly be aware of. Um, so uh, also I wanted to answer a question, uh, Stefan's question. Yeah, we're aware that there are gaps in our uh, analysis and uh, we did switch from one database to another. Perhaps we lost a bit of the German projects there, but as long as your, your projects are um, publicly announced and I did a quick research now, we, we will add those and yes, um, <laughs> the, 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 it's difficult to keep track of all the projects and, yeah. and surprisingly um, if you look at uh, press releases now from developers and, and investors there there's there, there's you know being subsidy free is not so new anymore so it, it tends to be almost forgotten in, in in these announcements so this is perhaps uh uh it reflects how we're moving towards this direction which is i guess is positive um, positive, as long as governments don't carry out too much intervention uh, in terms of the clawback, because yes, power prices are at record high. Yes, there is the debate on on decoupling um, the, the power market from the power prices from gas prices. But at the same time, we don't have to forget that there was no government intervention in, in last year when power prices went to record low, right? So, uh, um, yeah, um, I guess regulation, if you carry out regulation, it has to be in both senses, like a, a CFD, a contract for difference. So sorry for that digression. And uh, back to your question, I, I wouldn't say that we're necessarily moving uh, to rooftop uh, in terms of volumes or shares because that has fluctuated over the years. Um, definitely, I would say there's a huge opportunity to 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 accelerate on the rooftop side because if you look at rooftops across, even if you take, I, I just went on holidays and uh, you look out from, <laughs> look at the rooftops uh, from the car and and you say, okay, th there's a lot of space there. Why why is this not happening and um, uh, in Italy, for example, the government just uh, passed a law which allows you to build a system up to 200 kilowatts without, ne without the need of any permit. You just have to do a self-declaration, which is simply an A4 uh, pa piece of paper, submit it to the authorities, and then you can go uh, ahead and, and build your rooftop project, as long as it's rooftop and it's not in any you know, sensitive area from a cultural heritage perspective. Um, and and um, so, yeah, uh, it, it, perhaps it's a low hanging fruit. And, and as I said during my pre presentation, there are ways uh, to tweak existing policies without have to, having to radically shift um, things around in, in order to increase demand. Now, there, there's the, that barrier about um, in, in installers, which Stefan just mentioned, and, and that, that 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 probably uh, Stefan has more visibility than, than than myself on that side. But um, if that bottleneck is happening, then then yes, we we'll, we have to find uh, think about ways to to overcome that that hurdle. 
Yeah, but um, but I think so. Maybe also there's one thing we we have to look into. At least where uh, at Solar Power Europe um, are lobbying at that also is of course mandatory solar. I think we've seen that now in a couple of um, German states now. I think Baden-Württemberg. I think as of May, it's actually now um, it's kicking in. So um, as of as of May, you really have to build solar on, on on new builds. And I think the the German government is also considering that for for commercial rooftops actually on a federal level. Um, I think that could be probably then seen if that somewhat works also in other countries. Um, and maybe I think so um, with the, with the, with the, the skills um, of, of installers, I think the, the problem of, um, of good people, um, you see that in every industry at the moment. Um, and so, so the question is maybe also, because in, in solar you had also these small installer shops also, if big electricians and other trades are coming in again now that solar is also becoming more attractive in terms of because you can sell a heat pump you can basically sell a charger so that it is a much bigger um, um, yeah sum and actually the profit is also much bigger because in the past um, for a small system, it was really not very attractive for installers to to really come out. Uh, so I, I don't know if that that might might change. Huh? Yeah, I think it will, will change because, um, as it correctly mentioned, I mean, in the past it was only a deal of a PV system. Earnings were not so high. Now you can do it online. Uh, you buy a PV system. Uh, you want to have your charging system and the storage. Uh, and and uh, and then whatever the uh, salesperson or the installer team is not coming only because of a two kilowatt system. No? So they have automatically per uh, uh, client, I would say easily 30,000 plus uh, euro re revenue only on one deal. No? And I agree with you. So this is, I would say, a natural change no? which we, we see. And on the other hand, let us also do not underestimate the, the bureaucracy, the changes in the bureaucracy. So making things simpler for residential and commercial, this has a lead time of at least a year, yeah, because you have to go through the through the uh, departments of the government and so on. So at the moment, I think we are trying to push here in Europe, make it simple, increase whatever the the tariff which you get, uh, which you do not consume by yourself, uh, up to eight or ten cents or twelve cents or whatever for residential. And then automatically it, it will change again. You have to adjust it probably again uh, in one year when the all the taxes and bureaucracy is gone. Um, but I agree with you. So um, there is always a way um, how we can how we can manage um, the challenge with the installers. But on the other hand, we are speaking about an increase from I don't know two and a half gigawatt over the last few years up to fifteen in Germany only. Yeah. So you 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 I don't know t really three four times of the actual. Uh, systems and this is 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 a, is a challenge. This is very clear, but a positive challenge. Let's say like this. Okay, I think so. We are running a bit over time. So, but what I would like to ask everyone, um, so as a as a final statement. So, when we look at um, 2022, so wh where do you think? So, with all these boundary conditions that we have, can we end up in terms of installation? So there are different asks and uh, suggestions and estimates. Um, so commission again wants to have 60 gigawatt. We had, at, at least I'm talking to you now, 60 gigawatt. We had uh, 27 uh, last year. So that would be more than more than doubling. And uh, uh, so what do you think can the industry do? Um, so um, in terms of installations, and do you think actually that um, we go to an installation level of, of 100 gigawatt plus in 2025 in the EU. Is that possible um, it, with, when, when taking all the, the, the boundary conditions into, into, into your view? Maybe I think uh, Pietro, you first, and then Ada, and then Stefan. I think, yeah, for 2022, I, I don't see major optics. So I would say around 32 gigawatts this year, or perhaps we will be pleasantly surprised at the end of the year. Uh, in terms of whether 100 gigawatts is feasible, I would say technically it is, because think about 2011 when Germany, Italy were installing, it connecting to the grid uh, 10 gigawatts each. Um, so definitely something was driving the market back then. And those were in Italy, there were many small projects. So. Yes, the grid operators were very busy uh, connecting the projects, but 
technically it could be done. Um, then whether, yeah, that will be the case that there's so many variables. Um, it's definitely a, a huge number. Okay, Ada? Um, yeah, I, I guess this year, um, I expect to see around 35 gigawatts, um, but yeah, I know the target is, is, is very ambitious. And we can easily reach this. Yes, we have seen um, uh, distributed markets is, is growing a lot. Um, like um, the point that you mentioned already, awareness is increasing, high energy prices. Um, for example, I best in Netherlands. Uh, here we have over one gigawatt residential installations. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that I mean, with even the high prices, that, that's fine because of the institute. So I really expect also distribution markets um, um, will grow a lot. And I, I guess the only thing is that we need to have it um, besides permits and paperwork, which becomes much easier now, it's a manpower. I guess um, um, we need more hands uh, to do uh, to reach um, such, such aggressive targets. I, I wouldn't surprise if so many new installers will crop up in Germany in the next few years. Uh, because we, we, we market needs this. I mean, that's the only obstacle what I what I see at the moment. Okay, Stefan. Yeah, uh, let me say it with a smile. I fo follow Ada because Ada. Uh, <laughs> everything depends on, on our Asian uh, sub suppliers. If they can deliver more, we can do more. Keep it simple. So, uh, and, and this is for me the, the the restriction. Yeah. So as I told you, there are a lot of projects which are only waiting for your modules, uh, and not only you, but I re you represent, I would say, a lot of other uh, suppliers. And this is, I think, for the, for the next year, for this year and for the, for the next year, still the, the biggest restriction. All the other things, even if I say permits and installers, I think we can manage it. If, 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 if the Asian supplier says we can deliver more, then we do more. Yeah? So I think it's, let's keep it simple. So, but that means also you also don't see also from from grid connection point of view by 2025 that we can go to the 100 gigawatt level and uh, manage that also um, because I think we can manage this and and again the interesting thing is I, I don't know if you have seen it there are big announcements now in uh, in Germany about uh, in in industrial uh, in investments uh, in Intel in Magdeburg uh, North Northwald and in, in northern part of Germany they are coming now where the renewable energy is. And this is interesting. So they are not going to Bavaria. So, uh, and, and I think that there will be probably also a competition between the federal states, which I think is, is great. No? So, and again, if we, we also find a way, and this is whole Europe, if we find a way to, to tie up with, our, with, the, with, with the farmers, then I think um, also land will be no issue. Okay, perfect. Okay, then thanks to everyone staying with us and uh, shining some light on uh, supply demand and prices in Europe in 2022. Um, great to have you here. Um, so just about uh, Taiyang. Um, so if we, we are publishing a lot of reports, um, a couple of other um, new ones coming out in the next few weeks. Um, uh, the next one will be on advanced modules. We will also distribute at InterSolar. Um, and uh, that's maybe also the point. So um, I think most of you will be at InterSolar. Um, if you want to meet, drop an email. Um, and uh, in any case, I'm also um, I'm responsible this year for organizing the InterSolar conference, the content of this. We will have many more in-depth presentations there. Um, Inner Park will also present. Um, and we will have also Bloomberg's Jenny Chase present. So if you want to learn more, um, please uh, join the InterSolar conference um, and otherwise hopefully meet there. I think that should be uh, a big party and the largest solar event of the year. Thanks again to everyone and have a nice Thank day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.